Why do we use different exercises to train the same muscle? It's a common question in the gym. If one exercise trains a muscle, then what's the point of doing more exercises to train the same muscle? Why not make things simple and just do 20 sets of bench press and call it a day? The short answer is that doing more exercises will maximize your results. There's no doubt about it. And the real question we should be asking is how many different exercises should we use? So we're going to try to attempt to find out how many and why. If you've been to the gym for any length of time, you've probably noticed that a typical workout program consists of roughly anywhere between 5 and 9 different exercises. This seems to be the standard across the board, so our big question is why? More specifically, is this a good amount of exercises or should there be more? Or perhaps even less? There are actually a few things to consider before answering this question, the first being how much work can be placed on a muscle. Since one of the most important variables in the process of muscle growth is the muscle's ability to recover for the next training session. When we go to the gym, we're essentially breaking down a muscle. Lifting weights causes stress and inflammation, which will trigger an anabolic response or the rebuilding phase. When put together, this creates a cycle of continuously stressing a muscle followed by repair. In other words, stressing a muscle is an imperative part of growth, making it a good thing, provided you're able to recover from that stress, of course. A threshold exists, though, where too much stress can actually be a detriment as the muscle is unable to recover in a timely manner. So in order to know how many exercises we should do, we need to know where this threshold lies. On top of that, we need to find out what the benefit of training a muscle with various exercises even brings. Is there any point to using a bunch of exercises, or does it just make us feel good that we're doing something different? So let's first determine the maximum amount of stress a muscle can handle, and by handle we mean its maximum recoverable volume. Volume is the total amount of work that we put on the muscle, generally measured in a week of training. This is sometimes calculated as the total amount of weight, which is found by multiplying the sets times reps times load or weight. However, for the remainder of this video, we'll be speaking of set volume. This is the total amount of working sets you use to train a muscle. For example, let's say you're doing bench press and perform two warm-up sets followed by three working sets of five reps. The total set volume would be three. Therefore, the maximum recoverable volume means the maximum amount of working sets we can use to train a muscle in a week that still allows it to recover. Fortunately, thanks to scientific studies, we have a pretty good idea of what this number is. One of the most clear studies was a review of literature done in 2022 by a team of researchers who looked at seven studies which examined set volume and muscle hypertrophy. To simplify things, they put the trainees into groups, those who performed less than 12 working sets for a muscle every week, those that performed 12 to 20 working sets weekly for a muscle, and those that performed 20 plus working sets. They found that the 12 to 20 set group and the 20 plus set group produced significantly greater gains than those who did less than 12 sets. However, there was no significant difference between the 12 and 20 and the 20 plus set group. This means that after 20 sets, you'll likely start to see diminishing returns. Therefore, you should plan on performing 10 to 20 working sets to train each muscle. Awesome, so we do 20 sets of pull-ups. Well, no. It's probably pretty obvious, but you shouldn't use just one exercise for all your sets. We've all heard that variety is the spice of life, and as it turns out, variety is also the spice of your lifting life. Here's why. It has to do with the phenomenon seen to occur within the growth of a muscle. If you're like most people, you probably assume a muscle is a muscle and will grow when it's activated. Well, it doesn't, at least not homogeneously or in a uniform manner. We need to remember that a muscle is not a single solid piece of tissue, rather it's a collection of smaller fibers that are all bundled together in various formations and held tightly together, kind of like a rope. At that same time, the entirety of a muscle does not have the same exact endpoints known as the origin and the insertion. The origin of a muscle is where it attaches to the bone that remains stationary, the non-moving part. The insertion is the part of the muscle that's attached to the bone that's actually pulling the limb. Since variations can occur within the same muscle, distinct regions of the muscle will exert varying forces and experience greater strain during different movements. For these reasons, researchers have discovered that the entirety of a muscle will actually not grow uniformly when worked with a single exercise. This non-uniform growth in the muscle actually manifests in a few different ways. One area where uneven growth occurs are in the different heads of the muscle. Remember before when we talked about the origin and the insertion of a muscle? Well, many muscles will have several different origins. The muscle bellies from these origins all then run down to the bone and eventually merge into one spot. A muscle belly is the fleshy, contractile part of the muscle responsible for generating force. As they then travel to the bottom of the bone, they merge into one tendon for insertion. 
These heads are often of different length, width, and may even be composed of different size muscle fibers. Further, they may travel at different angles depending on their origin. For example, your biceps have two heads, a short head and a long head. Your triceps has three heads, medial, lateral, and long head, while your quadriceps have four heads. While all these muscles will contract to perform a primary movement, each head will have a slightly different special job. For example, the posterior deltoid performs shoulder extension, or bringing the arm backward, while the anterior deltoid flexes the shoulder, bringing the arm forward. However, along with the lateral deltoid, they'll all contract to drive the arm abduction along the frontal plane. In addition, these muscles are activated differently depending on the angle of force put on it. For example, this study found that 12 different variations of the bench press made by altering the grip and bench angle hit the three heads of the pectoralis major differently. That is, different combinations of the bench press placed more or less growth on the different heads. What this means in application is that if you were to only choose one combination, you may get amazing growth for one of the heads while the others would fall back. Still, while many people are somewhat aware of the idea of training the different heads of a muscle, it gets a bit more complicated since it seems that just about every region of every head can experience difference in growth. There was a large review from 2000 that researched the growth in muscle fibers, and the entire review was dedicated to looking at non-uniformity of muscle growth. In it, they looked at a study from 1996 that used six months to train the quadriceps with knee extensions. After that six months, the researchers found significant differences in growth of the four heads. When measuring the cross-sectional area of the quadriceps as a whole, the researchers found that the proximal region, those closest to the body, and the distal regions, those parts furthest from the body, increased by 19%, while the central region only increased by 13%. They also found that the vastus lateralis and the rectus femoris showed the greatest hypertrophy in the distal region, while the vastus intermedius and the medialis muscles showed greater hypertrophy in the proximal region. So basically, different regions of the foreheads all saw different amounts of growth, and in fact, the review mentions that even single muscle fibers grow differently. Luckily, there have been studies that look at the results of using multiple exercises versus single exercises in a training program on muscle growth such as a 2014 study where the researchers wanted to see what happens if you use just one exercise or multiple exercises to train the quads. The single exercises consisted of the squat, while the multiple exercise group trained the squat, leg press, deadlift, and lunge. The results were quite interesting. They found that both groups produced similar growth in the cross-section area of the quads. However, there's always nuance. When measuring the growth of the four heads of the quadriceps, they all saw even growth with the four exercises. On the other hand, the squat only group only saw significant growth in the vastus lateralis and the vastus intermedius, while the rector femoris and the vastus medialis did not exhibit substantial increases in growth. That's to say, using multiple exercises produced more uniform growth, while a single exercise resulted in lopsided growth. In theory, this would result in greater overall muscle growth over time as well as better aesthetics. The review concludes saying it would be advisable for bodybuilders to engage in different exercises to induce hypertrophy of different regions of a muscle, and that using multiple exercises to train a muscle should be an integral part of a training program. The problem is it doesn't make suggestions on how many. It seems it would make sense to use a separate exercise to specifically hit each head of every muscle. However, we only have a fixed amount of sets. Should we do 20 different exercises with only one set each, or is doing 5 different exercises with 4 sets better? Actually, again, we have a pretty good answer. Back in 2010, a meta-analysis was performed that compared the effects of a single set and multiple sets on muscle hypertrophy. The entire meta-analysis reviewed 8 studies to assess if any dose response existed with increased working sets. While they found that there was a positive trend toward more sets per exercise, no significant difference was found between 2-3 to three sets per exercise and 4-6 to six sets per exercise, and this was true for both trained and untrained individuals. One thing should be noted though, during the time of the study, there was a limited number of other studies that used 4-6 to six sets per exercise. Therefore, while there was a small positive trend associated with 4-6 to six sets, there simply weren't enough studies to become statistically significant. At that same time, a study from 2017 looked at the same question but specifically with upper body exercises. In it, they concluded that high sets of three or more aren't significantly better than one to two sets in untrained men. And in trained men, there are insufficient studies to make a conclusion. Therefore, it seems that when training a muscle for hypertrophy, two to three sets is probably sufficient. 
while four may have additional benefits. But we know that variation does, so stick to the two to three sets. And while we're talking about the number of exercises, we also need to acknowledge another very important factor, exercise selection. The exercises you choose are just as important as the number of exercises, possibly even more important. So let's examine the functionality of different exercises by looking at the biomechanics involved. Many of our different muscles actually cross not just one joint, but two. This means flexing two joints can work the same muscle, but with entirely different biomechanics. For example, hamstrings cross the knee joint and the hip joint on the posterior section, while the quadriceps cross the knee and the hips on the anterior. In addition, both the triceps and the biceps cross the elbow and shoulder joint. To ensure you maximally hit each muscle, you need to be sure to hit it with exercises that mimic its function. So in order to fully hit the hamstrings, you need to use an exercise that utilizes knee flexion, such as leg curls. However, as the hamstring cross the hips, you also need to use a hip hinge movement, such as Romanian deadlifts. Now let's look at the biceps in more detail. Have you ever realized that when you do a curl, your elbow tends to come forward? This is because the long head actually crosses the shoulder joint and assists in elbow flexion when the arm lifts up in front of the body. This is what makes the Bayesian curl a favorite exercise for smart lifters. The Bayesian curl has you perform a single arm cable curl while looking away from the weight, which pulls your arm back. When you perform the curl, you drag your elbow forward with shoulder flexion while doing the curl. Other exercises could also include incline curls. Let's use the brachialis as another example. If you want bigger arms, it's vital you train the brachialis as it runs underneath the belly of the biceps muscle. Even though you can't see it, growing it will still require more space in the arm causing it to expand. So how do we train it? Well, let's look at its anatomy and its function. When looking at the function of the biceps, it's responsible for supination of the forearm and flexing of the elbow, but only in a supinated position, that is, palms up. In contrast, the brachialis has only one job to do, flex the elbow, and this occurs in every position. Knowing this, we know that the best way to enlarge this muscle is by using a neutral grip such as a hammer curl, or a pronated grip that's palms down such as a reverse curl. This mitigates the biceps and puts the majority of the stress on the brachialis. Again, the point is that exercise selection is just as important as the number of exercises we use to train the muscle, if not more. Using three strategically selected exercises will be better than four or five random ones. Also, realize that every exercise doesn't need to be a completely new exercise. Rather, you can simply make alterations to the movement. For example, using different grips like we saw in the chest study, as well as the discussion on the biceps and the brachialis. Also, putting the body at different angles will alter muscle activation. For example, many leg press machines have a backrest that allows you to adjust the angle. Sitting with the backrest more upright, similar to sitting in a chair, will cause greater flexion in your hips. This greater amount of hip flexion will require more involvement of the hamstrings muscle. On the other hand, leaning back more creates less flexion in the hips. This will decrease the involvement of the hamstrings and place a greater percentage of force on the quadriceps as knee extension will become the more dominant movement. Even different foot placement can cause differences in activation. And again, remember the bench press study. The main point is you don't necessarily need a completely different exercise in your repertoire. You just need to make the correct alterations. Okay, so how do we apply everything we learned from these studies to our real life? The problem is that even with what we know, there's no clear-cut guide that tells us how many exercises we need to perform. But we can use all the information to make an educated guess. Let's first remember that a muscle should be hit with 10 to 20 sets per week. Now let's assume you train your muscle twice a week. Multiple studies have found twice a week to be the optimal training frequency, which you should train a muscle. That means that the muscle should be hit with 5 to 10 sets per session. We also know that each exercise should use 2 to 3 sets per exercise. This seems to be where the threshold for hypertrophy lies, since as you recall, once you start doing more, you start to see diminishing returns. While we could maybe use more sets, remember that variety is the key as far as hypertrophy is concerned. By sticking to smaller numbers of sets, we can utilize more exercises, aka more variety. So with that said, use three sets for your bigger primary exercises, while your smaller exercises could use two. Therefore, you could train your large muscle groups with two to four exercises per session, two times a week. Keep in mind, the number of days a week you train can dictate this. Training five days versus three days gives you significantly more time. If you're trying to fulfill maximal sets per muscle group, you probably want to train five days a week, and we'll show you an example of a great program to use in just a moment. But first, one point to remember, 
While you can use two exercises that are biomechanically similar, they should be trained in different sessions. For example, let's say you're training your back. You could perform bent over rows in one session and the T-bar row or a bent over row with an underhanded grip in the second. Now when it comes to your smaller muscles, specifically the biceps and triceps, there's a little more nuance. Keep in mind that your arms are trained during every single upper body compound movement. For example, the biceps are hit during pull-ups while the triceps are hit with bench press. Therefore, they would only likely need an extra 10 sets of isolation work a week. That's max. This would equate to about 1-2 to two exercises a session. Again, that's a maximum. Further, your shoulders get hit a lot with every pushing and pulling exercise. Every type of horizontal movement trains the front deltoid, while every pulling exercise trains the rear deltoid. Therefore, they wouldn't need 3-4 to four shoulder-specific movements. They can also be good with around 10 specific sets a week. All in all, if we were to take everything into consideration, with a 5-day split, it would look something like this. Session 1, which targets the chest and back and consists of bench press, 3 sets of 5 reps or a 3x5, chin-ups 3x5, chest dips 3x8, T-bar row 3x8, barbell shrugs 3x10, cable fly 2x12, reverse fly 2x12, and face pull 2x12. Session 2 is all about the lower, so you'll do deadlift at a 3x5, front squat 3 sets of 6 reps, barbell good morning 3x8, machine hack squat 3x8, lying hamstring curl 2x12, leg extension 2 sets of 12 reps, calf raise 2x12, and finish with some core work. Session 3 hits the shoulders, chest, and arms. Military press 3 sets of 6 reps, incline dumbbell bench press 3x6, Arnold press 3x8, dumbbell pullover 3 sets of 10 reps, decline cable fly 2x10, rope upright row 2x10, hammer curl 2x12, overhead triceps extension with a rope 2x12. Session 4 is lower again but with different exercises. So we have the back squat with 3 sets of 5 reps, Romanian deadlift with 3x5, split squat 3x8, hip thrust 3x8, leg extension 2x12, Nordic curl 2x5, standing calf raise 2x12, and some core work. And then session 5 is back, shoulders, and arms. Rack pull, 3 sets of 5 reps, seated dumbbell overhead press 3x8, dumbbell row 3x8, lat pull down 3x8, lateral raises 2x10, face pull 2x10, easy curl 2x12, and triceps push down 2x12. There's one more factor to consider. You can swap out your exercises, or that's to say you should swap out your exercises. Swapping out your exercises gives you the ability to provide even more stimuli to your body to challenge it while also keeping things interesting. However, you don't want to swap out too often, as it will not allow you to properly apply progressive overload. Progressive overload is the idea that in order to see continuous muscle adaptations, such as size or strength, one must continually place a greater demand on the muscle over time. Therefore, swapping exercises weekly does not allow a lifter to improve upon their lift, as they're always changing what they do. Rather, you want enough time to become accustomed to the exercise and then improve upon it. Once you train the exercise for some time, your progress will begin to slow, and then you can swap. Unfortunately, there's no hard number for this, but generally a time period of 4-8 to eight weeks is given. We would advise to use the longer period of 6-8 to eight weeks for your larger compound exercises. On the other hand, your isolation exercises could be swapped every 4 weeks. Keep in mind, you can swap them all at once, or you could even just swap one per week. As we see, when it comes to exercises, there does seem to be some truth to more is better, at least in terms of variation. Therefore, your goal should be to utilize the largest variation of exercises within your ability to recover. Program them in a sensible manner so that you can apply progressive overload to them before any swapping. If you can do that, you'll have the optimal amount of exercises to maximize growth.